Thanks a lot, Marilyn. Okay, well, welcome, folks. It's uh, time to get this uh, little meeting underway. So uh, we've got, uh, you know, a few people logged in. I'm, I don't see our uh, presenter yet, uh, Tyler Wilson. I bet he's still working on his presentation. <laughs> You know, trying to get it, trying to get it ready. The uh, hello, Robert. So, Mr. Andrews, where part of the world are you in today? Uh, Decatur, Illinois. Okay, so uh, have you been snowed in there yet? Yes. <laughs> Mostly the drifting snow got us. Oh, okay. And I, unfortunately, I'm driving a little car and not an SUV. Okay. Hello, Roger. I see you've got video now. Yeah. I'm on my iPad. Oh, okay. And hello, Casey from uh, Payson. How are you doing? I'm doing okay. If everything goes according to plan, I go home in a week and a half. Well, that'll be, that'll be good. So uh, this is an Elmer night and... Uh, so it's not like our normal meeting, uh, but uh, I, I have absolutely no idea where Tyler is. Oh, hello, Luke. Did you send him a reminder? Uh, I'm going to text him here in a minute. He knows about it, of course. <laughs> uh, you know, that's the, uh, that's the, the guest of honor isn't here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I'm gonna go on mute and see if I can figure out what's going on with Hey, Roger. How are you doing, Rob? Freezing. <laughs> Where are you of course, at? we had a heat wave come through today. We started at minus six and ended at 14. <laughs> <laughs> well, things will improve. Oh, yeah. Looking at those people down there in Texas, I can feel for them. Yeah. I'm just reading the article about how they're rescuing turtles out there on Padre Island. I was just out there last week. I'm, uh, oh, does it say I'm uh, on the super slow laptop tonight? And so joining us is taking longer than I would have anticipated. Uh, Robert, my wife okay. just left uh, you hear me? Uh, Texas just before that big storm hit. Yeah, Tyler, wow. I hear you fine. That's Laptop tonight, longer than I would have anticipated. Let me get a better laptop to present with. It's occupied. Okay. So, my laptop that I was going to present just locked up, it is literally frozen. My laptop that I was going to present with just locked up. It is uh, literally yeah. frozen. We're hearing it we're hearing oh, yeah. from both machines. Okay, I'm going to leave one. Okay, I'm going to leave one. Well, that worked really well. I saw on Facebook a post uh, in one of the ham radio groups of someone that's in Texas um, right now that they don't have any power or anything, but he was able to use his um, HF rig and link to email his family and know that they're doing okay and things like that. Oh, that's pretty cool. Okay, Luke, uh, you know, the, the, the so called frozen laptop is. Uh, uh, or, uh, yeah, it's telling me my. Uh, uh, Internet connection is yeah. unstable. Yeah. Shoot. 
You're probably going to have to blow it away. Yeah, give, give me a second. Hi, Rowan. So welcome everybody. I think we have a pretty nice group, little group here. I see Michael Wells yeah, Michael back from Wells. Newly. Never mind. And, and we are recording. So uh, one of these. Hey, Blake. Days, go ahead. Oh, sorry. I just saw Blake was online. I didn't mean to cut anybody off. Hey, Blake. Glad you're online. Glad you're online. Yeah, it's good to be alive. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, well, maybe okay. just a couple of announcements before, uh, well, <clears throat> while uh, Tyler is trying to get himself ready. The, uh, the great Utah shakeout is April 15th. Uh, and you know what, while that's uh, two months away, and I'm getting a big echo here. The, uh, while it's two months away, we are starting to, okay, I've got to, you've got to mute you. Okay, so the, uh, the Tooele County Emergency Management plans to do a kind of a bigger deal for the uh, Utah shakeout on the April the 15th. And uh, they're inviting a number of businesses to um, uh, get trained on, uh, on the Orion's damage assessment app and, uh, and then use that app while they're on, you know, up, you know, that day to uh, do a, a simulated uh, um, disaster assessment. <clears throat> and to that end, they've, uh, you know, they've asked me to do the training. And I think that's a grand idea, but I think I'd like to rehearse and practice the training before we uh, try it out on the uh, business community here in Tooele. Uh, so I'm going to be setting up a uh, an opportunity for any am amateur radio operators who want to uh, get trained on uh, the Orion app. And so I can rehearse and work through the training. And then we will, uh, <clears throat> you know, and then, and then I can go ahead and do the training for the, uh, uh, for the various businesses, you know, here in town. So uh, I'll, be, I'll be announcing that on Facebook, on the webpage, and also uh, be sending it out an email. Uh, you'll, need to, you'll, you'll need to register. Now, some of you have already taken the training and if you'd like to take it again, I'm happy to do that as well. Uh, you know, kind of an affair. All right. So, so that's the uh, that that's the that one announcement. Another announcement comes out of uh, Blake over in um, Wendover, and what he's offering, he has uh, you know quite a quite a nice capability over there. Uh, he's got coax cable. He's got connectors. He's got the uh, connecting sets and everything else necessary in order to make them happen, make things happen. And so uh, if anybody over in, in the window area needs and wants assistance, get a hold of, uh, get a hold of Blake. And, uh, you know, now it's not for free, he, you know, he'll charge you for the, uh, you know, for the cost of the materials, but, uh, and, but he'll hap happily get you operating and going. So uh, over there in the window area, you've got a nice resource. Okay, let's go back to uh, Tyler. You're looking a lot more like yourself. <laughs> yeah, I've got my wife's work laptop. That's why uh, my name says Emily. Um, okay. well, you know. I have I have this laptop. We got a, a doorbuster from Dell uh, a couple Christmases ago. It only came with four gigs of RAM. So <laughs> it does not run anything very well. Okay, so what I'd like to do is I'd like to invite everyone else to please mute your uh, microphones. 
And, uh, and if you do have something you want to say, you know, go ahead and unmute and bring it up. But while we're doing the presentation, it would be uh, really good if you would just, uh, un, you know, unmute. So I'm going to spotlight you, which means that you're going to take over the screen. And Tyler, it's all yours. All right. Thanks, Roland. Uh, looks like I, sh I should have uh, looked in the mirror before I jumped on a Zoom meeting, but it's all good. This is what you get when you work at home. You don't have to worry about how your coworkers are afraid of your hairdo. Anyway, so um, I want to start off. I'll, I'll go ahead and share my screen um, and show you what I've been working on. Come on. Oh, Roland, uh, can you enable screen sharing, please? Okay, done. All right, there we go. Okay, so I, I wanna start off this presentation by saying uh, I am far from an expert on antenna theory or amateur radios as a whole. Um, I'll, I'll, I'm gonna give you a little bit more information about myself later, but um, this is about me. I have only been a ham for a little over a year. Uh, it was literally less, it was probably almost exactly a year ago that I got my, uh, the email from the FCC with my new uh, call sign. Um, I upgraded to a general in April um, but the, the point of this, uh, Elmer night tonight is not that I'm the expert and I know all the answers. It's that, uh, I'm having fun learning and I want to share that with you guys. So this is about me. I, I've been ham, like I said, since February of 2020, just before the world went all COVID on us. Um, I remember I was on a business trip in Colorado Springs when I got my call sign and I was, I was really excited to get home and get on the air. Uh, initially, the uh, FCC issued me the call sign KJ7MFH. Uh, however, those, those initials reminded me of a Samuel Jackson movie where he's yelling, uh, he's angry at hams on an airplane. <laughs> Every time somebody said MFH, uh, that naughty word came into my head. So I applied for a vanity call sign and got my initials TCW um, instead. Uh, rolls off the tongue a little bit better. Um, I earned my money by uh, managing computers for the Army at Dugway. Uh, if you ever talk to somebody at Dugway and they curse out whoever made them reboot their computer during the middle of the day for updates, that was me. And uh, I'm an Army veteran. I was a combat engineer uh, in the Utah Army National Guard and the regular US Army from 92 to 01. Um, if you want me to break down uh, the actual breakdown there, someday we can do that in another venue. This is my family. This is why I do everything I do. This is uh, the wonderful people that, that inspire me to go about day, day to day. I'm the ugly one in the back. Luckily, all the kids take after their mom. So they're all pretty good looking kids. All right. So this is where I got started. Uh, this is my father-in-law, uh, Rodney Scott. His uh, call sign is K7DLI active member of the Sinbad Desert Amateur Radio Club. And uh, he gave me a gift for passing my uh, technician exam. He gave me this, uh, this aluminum J pole that he had built. Um, now I, I asked him where he got the plans for it. And he couldn't remember, somewhere out on the internet. Um, so I found, here's a, a, a place that has some good plans. And uh, Norm Burriston pointed me to these plans with Aero Antenna over here. You can either use this PDF to get the plans or you can order one from Aero Antennas. Also, if any of you know um, Carl Pachris in the Utah Valley Amateur Radio Club, he sells these things as well. Um, this is just a really good all around multi-bander um, J-pole. But what fascinated me about it was the the performance i mean this this antenna um reaches amazingly well i i've i've made a simplex contact with a trucker on i-15 going south through spanish fork from my home here in south rim 
And I've talked uh, several times with uh, a ham named by the call sign of Kilo Romeo One Papa, Crip up in Leighton um, on Simplex. Um, so I'm, I'm pretty, uh, pretty impressed with that. Um, if you guys can give me just one second here. All right, so that was my inspiration to build, start building my own antennas. I was, I was really impressed with this antenna that my father-in-law built for me and how well it worked. And um, that's a picture of it there mounted on my house. Um, so I, I said, I wanna learn how to build my own antennas. So I wanna make sure you guys understand once again, I'll, you'll, I'll say this a lot and a lot. I am not an antenna expert, but I love experimenting. I love building and I love learning. And so when, when Roland asked me to, to talk about this, I said, I'd love to just encourage people that you can build your own antennas. Um, there's a lot of really complicated stuff that goes into antennas. And sometimes when you're doing internet research, you can get buried in those doctorate level theories. <laughs> but uh, if you just dive in and start, start working on it, you, you'll be surprised how much you'll learn and how fast. All right, here's my overarching rule for uh, antenna building. If it's stupid, but it works, it ain't stupid. This picture over here on the left is, was, was my uh, HF antenna mast for about five or six months, all summer long pretty much. Um, just later in the fall, I finally mounted it on the top of my house. Um, but it's an old basketball standard that my kids no longer use. So I tore the back belt, backboard and the hoop off of it. And uh, I bolted a 12 foot two by four to the top of it. And that gave me 15, 16 feet of elevation for my uh, fan dipole there. Um, I, I got a hundred foot uh, coaxial cable, pushed it out as far from the house as I could. And uh, I made contacts all over the world with that thing. Um, it's not ideal. Um, I know that I was probably cooking a lot of worms, having it that close to the ground, but it worked. All right. So as, as we, as you dive into building antennas for yourself, just remember this, the, the final test for any antenna is what I call the push to talk test. If you push the key and somebody answers, you did something right. All right. Now, I, I know there's lots of talk about compromise antennas and, and, and rep. Yeah, if, it, if somebody can hear you, you did something right. Um, now, I, before I go on, I wanted to bring up another thing is, as I say over and over again, I'm not the expert. Uh, we've got a lot of people listening that know a lot more about antennas than I do. So please, if you hear me say something stupid, <laughs> I invite you to, to call me on it, all right? Um, if you know something better than, than, than what I've learned, I would love for you to share it with the group. Um, and if you have any questions, especially questions, um, this will be a much more interesting discussion if uh, it's a, there's some back and forth, not just Tyler rambling on for an hour. Um, so please, I, I want you guys to feel welcome to interrupt me um, with whatever you think might move this discussion forward. So um, my kids tease me about this stuff on this slide. I have, since I got my ham radio license, um, everywhere I go, I'm looking at stuff and I say, that'd make an antenna, that'd make a good antenna. <laughs> we walk through the hardware store and I see the aluminum rods there and I think, man, I could turn that into an antenna or the welding rods or anything, I see scrap metal. If we go to the ReStore um, in Salt Lake, if you've never been to the ReStore, they, they have a lot of um, home improvement stuff that people donate to the ReStore. Um, it's housing, something for humanity. Anyway, <laughs> they build houses for people that can't afford their own houses. And a lot of construction companies contribute old building materials. It's kind of a building materials thrift store. Oh man, there's so much antenna material in that store. I could spend hours. 
but look around you and 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 look for element materials. Um, copper, aluminum um, are of course the best. Well, they're not the best. Gold and silver are the best antenna materials, but who can afford a gold antenna, right? That's uh, a little bit more money than most people are willing to put out. But for affordable materials, copper and aluminum are, are the best. Um, most ferrous metal is not ideal, but as you'll see when I, when I get to my steel tape measure antennas, steel can be used. Um, you just have to take into account that it's uh, not as good or not as conductive as the copper or aluminum. Um, does anybody else have any idea, other experiences or ideas of weird and bizarre things that you've used um, for an antenna element? Um, if you do, I, I would love to hear about them. I'm, I'm always fascinated with stories I read uh, of the guy that uh, tuned up his rain gutter. <laughs> he attached a coax cable to his rain gutter, plugged it into his antenna tuner, and was able to, uh, to make contacts with it. Um, I saw one story of a guy that tuned up a ladder. He had an aluminum step ladder out in his backyard. He, he hooked up some coax cables and ran a couple of... Uh, um, radials and uh, was able to, to get signals out on it. Any, anybody else have any other weird or strange antenna materials that they've experienced? Uh, you know, this is Roland going back many years when, when you know, when you, we would tune up our radios by connecting the radio to a light bulb. And then you would, you know, these were tube type radios and you would tune it to get the brightest light that you could get on the light bulb. And, and I've made contacts on a light bulb. I think it's still possible to do that. Once a year, there is a group out in the East that does a contest to see how many, how many light bulb contacts you can make. Nice. And I, I love stuff like that. I love it because, you know, it, it proves that if, if you've got the ingenuity, if you, if you're willing to, to, try that final, that push to talk test, uh, you'd be surprised what you can accomplish. Emily? Right. Go ahead, go ahead. Emily? <laughs> Just teasing Tyler. Oh. <laughs> uh, uh, yes, Blake. Uh, back when I first got my ham license in 96 in California, I couldn't really afford, you know, buying store-bought already made antennas. So darn near that first three, four years I was a ham, I home built everything from articles out of the old QST magazines. Uh, if you remember way back when the old off-air TV antennas that people had on their houses, tearing them up, I made 10 element, 15 element homemade beams out of them that worked fine. Uh, like you say, anything I can find, I used it, found an article and did it. And, uh, <clears throat> just rolling for your information. Also, I just, uh, yesterday finally broke down and joined ARRL. <laughs> uh, I did update, uh, my membership thing in the website, by the way, that I'm there. But, uh, when they said on there, <coughs> excuse me that uh, <clears throat> I could dig into the archives of old QST magazines. Oh boy, howdy, I wanna try and get some of them old ones. And uh, they had a lot of great home-built stuff back then. And uh, once I dig in there and find it eventually, I'll, uh, Tyler, I'll send it to you. You know, the old antenna plans like that to make stuff like that, copper, the old copper j pole things and just halos two meter omni halos uh man one time i made a 10 element uh i guess you'd call it like the kushcraft a14820 is where you got 10 horizontal and 10 vertical elements on a beam made one of those worked great but I won't take up more time, but I just wanted to pass that on. Um, that's awesome, Blake. That, that's ahead. amazing. And, and that's one of the things I love about ham radio is um, not only does it encourage 
or not only does it allow experimentation, it encourages it. You know, that's that's awesome stuff. Um, um, all right, I'm going to move on to support materials. I already covered my two by four and basketball standard. Oh, that's Pete the uh, Pete the lorikeet wanting to join in back there. Uh, my two by four and basketball standard support. And now I, I want to I want to qualify this statement here. Non-conductive mass materials might be easiest because they won't detune your antenna in any way. But don't limit your mind. The the uh, the prevalence of metal radio towers out there means that it is not only possible, but it's the standard in the industry. But when you're using these low power antennas, especially like what I'm going to share tonight, uh, using non-conductive insulator materials for your mast are going to make it a lot easier uh, when you're tuning your antenna so that you don't have to worry about uh, drifting off um, with the measurements that you make. All right, so not everything can come out of your junk box in your garage though. There are some things you'll probably end up buying. Um, and I'm just gonna share with you a few of the things that I've bought um, in building antennas. First and foremost, uh, if you're going to, um, hang on one second, let me stick this bird in the bathroom. It obviously is a bird. Maybe that bird wanted to say how he built an antenna for you, Tyler. <laughs> yeah, he's going to tell us he tuned up his cage. He just uh, attached the cable to his cage and uh, contacted uh, Mozambique, right? Um, he probably would call New Zealand if he could because that's where he's from. <laughs> anyway. So um, this was one of the first adapters I ever bought because um, I wanted to make antennas for my handy talkie. And of course, Baofeng uses this, uh, this type of connector and all the cables and antennas that I already had used the SO239. Um, and so I bought a, a two pack of these guys and uh, that's what I've been using whenever I hook my uh, Baofeng up to an external antenna is this guy. I did learn, I haven't learned it the hard way yet, but I, in looking at it and reading on the internet, I learned uh, that's a little tiny gap. Um, if you've got an external antenna attached to that thing, that's a lot of torque on a little tiny gold plated connector. Um, so just be aware of that when you're using this type of adapter that any sideways torque by your antenna or the weight of the cable or anything is all going to be borne by that little tiny about quarter of an inch right there. Um, this is the, uh, the better solution that I've seen. Um, I, have, I have, haven't picked up one of these yet, but I would recommend if you're going to use um, your external antenna with a handy talkie, you get an adapter more like this. That way, um, this cable will take all the sideways torque and uh, it's not so directly on the antenna mount on your handy talkie. And I know it's a Baofeng, 20 bucks and I'm uh, back in business, but still, <laughs> if, if you're running with your two or $300 Yesu, the same thing would probably apply. So um, if you're gonna use external antennas with your HT, I, re I would recommend some sort of uh, adapter with a cable in the middle like this so that you don't uh, ruin your machine, your, your radio. Um, all right, so this is another adapter that I've purchased. Um, I've used this in several dif different um, applications and, and we'll see uh, those later on. Um, this, this is a pretty neat little deal. The, uh, when you connect your coaxial to it, those of you that don't know, you take the core of the coax and you solder it to this little gold piece right here. And then the body of the connector gets connected in one way or another to the braid. Um, whether you connect the braid directly to one of these screw holes or 
In one case, I've connected this to a, an aluminum bracket um, that then has an, um, a ring connector that connects to the braid of the cable. Um, either way, that's how you get your, your, um, your driven element and your um, ground plane. Um, or your radials connected with these connectors. Um, now on this, on this antenna that I built for tonight's uh, presentation, I intended to use one of these connectors um, at the bottom of one of the end caps. I'll get to that in a minute, how that didn't work out. This would have been a much easier choice for that. Um, because there, you don't have to screw it to the thing. It's a bulkhead connector. So you take this nut off and then you put it through the hole and then you put the, the nut on from the inside. And um, then you can connect the braid to either this or you can um, somehow connect it over here. It's the same essential design, but um, better when you're better for some applications. And I, I wanted to use this for my project tonight, but I'll show you why that didn't turn out here in a minute. Um, and then this, um, on this, this slide, I want to say that I use the solder, 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 solder. We can de debate whether it's solder or solder later. <laughs> um, we can also debate crimp versus solder later. Um, for the pur purposes of this presentation, I'm using solder because I don't have a crimper. That's that's 100% the reason. I know, uh, and Roland's given me several great arguments for why crimp is better, and I won't argue. Um, I, I I acknowledge it probably is, but for a beginner and somebody that hasn't uh, picked up the the crimper yet or is too lazy to go borrow it from Roland, who's more than willing to lend his out, um, the solder connectors for coaxial cable um, can be can be pretty useful. I like this one that I put the link to here. Those are the ones I buy. Um, they're really heavy duty. I like them. I, I bought some earlier on that were really light and they, they felt rinky dink and, and cheap. These ones are really heavy and they're really forgiving when you go to put them together. Um, I, I speak as a guy who learned how to uh, <laughs> do this by watching YouTube videos. So they're, they're pretty forgiving. Um, and last of all, this one is not required. Like I said, the, the most telling test of your antenna is the push to talk test. However, be aware that if you want to make sure you're not gonna let the magic smoke out of your test equipment, uh, one of these uh, nano VNAs is a great, great option. Um, I've, I've learned um, how to use mine to, to read the SWR and the, the, um, the resistance. Um, I getting, I'm getting to the age where I have to put on glasses to see anything this small. And so I really suggest you get the software for your PC. Uh, not only is it easier to see, uh, but you have a lot more options for measurements and recording your measurements. Um, than you do on that tiny little screen. But I love my Nano VNA um, and, and I used it to tune my antenna for tonight. Um, and and I'll, I'll go over that a little bit more in detail, but um, I would highly recommend if you're, it's much better <laughs> to spend the $70 or so for a Nano VNA than it is to replace your radio. Unless of course, like me, you're playing with the Baofeng and then, you know, you can, you can blow three of those before you get to the cost of a nano VNA, right? <laughs> All right. Um, before I go on, has anybody got any questions, comments, anything they want to add to the discussion? All right. If you do, please, please interrupt me. I, I, I love to hear the, the experiences of you guys. All right. So now I'm going to show you some antennas that I've actually built. Um, uh, to this point, I've shown you antennas that people have built for me. Now here's one that I built. So the first is the tape measure Yagi. Um, I reviewed a lot, I, I read a lot and watched a lot of videos on tape measure Yagis before I finally found uh, KB9 VBR's plans. Uh, Michael Martins, I believe is his name. 
Uh, he's kind of fun to watch. He has this uh, constantly surprised expression on his face. Uh, <laughs> he's a really smart guy. Um, I, I just uh, I had to poke fun at his, his constantly surprised expression. Um, but his plans are really easy to follow. And his video doesn't have a lot of nonsense. It just gets right to here's what I did and here's how you do it. So uh, that's, the, uh, that's the plans I followed for my tape measure Yagi. Here's what it turned out like. Um, I know ironically, I, uh, or unironically, I used a tape measure to show the dimensions of my tape measure Yagi. Um, this one, I bought 10 feet of uh, Schedule 40 PVC, uh, a package of hose clamps, uh, two of the four-way connectors and one T connector, and um, some copper wire I had laying around. And the coax I used for this one is actually from a mag mount antenna that I broke. So I uh, clipped the, the coax off of it and used that for this project. Um, this one, I was really pleased with how this turned out. Um, I could, when I, when I had this on my, my uh, radio, um, I, I could find, I listened to a net that was happening and I could definitely, as I, as I moved the antenna, it pointed towards the repeater and then pointed away, I could definitely tell that I was getting much better, um, you know, uh, directional reception on this. Um, I've used this tracking satellites. I haven't made any satellite uh, contacts yet, but I have um, used this to track a satellite and just listen. Um, as it was going over the sky. Uh, one of these days, I hope to uh, <laughs> actually make some satellite contacts. Um, over here on the left side is my favorite part of this antenna. I can take this thing apart and shove it in my backpack. Um, it's, it breaks down into four or five pieces and you can tuck the, excuse me, tuck the tape measure up inside the connectors there. And um, I'll show you in a second. Um, I, if I had thought and drilled the hole for the coax in the T connector right here, instead of back here on the mast, then I could take that mast out. Um, as it is with the, the cable being stuck to the mast like that, um, I can't take it apart. But had I thought of that and done that, um, the cable would be coming out of the T and then I could take this uh, mast piece out and wouldn't have to worry about that. Now, um, I wanna point out the uh, solder job on this is pretty ugly. It looks like somebody stuck some silver bubble gum to it, right? Well, that was the first thing I ever soldered, ever. Um, I brought the soldering gun home from the store, unwrapped it and got out the solder and soldered that. Now I watched dozens of YouTube videos to figure out how I'm supposed to do it first, uh, but that's why it's so ugly. That's my first ever soldering job. Um, notice that, of course, you want to uh, use some sandpaper to rub the paint off the tape measure before you attach the, the coax to, uh, to it. Um, obviously, the tape paint doesn't conduct electricity very well, and it doesn't stick to solder very well either. Um, I used black tape and hot glue to keep the, the cable in place. Um, but other and oh that's right and to uh, to adjust the SWR you um, loosen these two hose clamps and you move the the tape closer or farther from each other that's how you adjust the the SWR now here's here's a question I don't even know really know the answer to this um, but the plans called for they call this a hairpin match and I understand that what that does is it keeps the voltages between the two uh, sides of the driven element equal. However, um, most other Yagi antennas that I've seen, uh, they use a gamma match, which um, there is no direct connection between the two elements. I don't know what the difference is, why this one calls for uh, an actual connection. Um, but as, as you'll see in my next antenna, it's not always required uh, when you have, when you split the, uh, the elements like this. Does anybody want to talk about the gamma match versus the hairpin match? 
I'll tell you just a little bit about it. This is Roland. Go ahead, the, please. The, uh, what you, essentially what that match is to do is intended to do is to bring the uh, impedance at the feed point back as close as possible to 50 ohms. And, and uh, because, you know, that looks like a short between the two sides. Mm -hmm. However, it, it's not really because for what you're feeding with, you're feeding it with alternating current. And so, you know, half the current is going one way and then half the current's going the other way back, you know, kind of back and forth in, in the way that, in the way that's working. That match, that uh, hairpin is actually a capacitor and you, you make it, you squeeze it together or make it larger to, uh, to adjust the, uh, the impedance at the feed point. So, so that's, that's how a hairpin match works. A gamma match, uh, on, on the other hand, uh, adds additional length, or, you know, th theoretical length to the uh, coax on one side or the other, you know, in, in a method of trying to make it, uh, you know, again, bringing the feed point back to an impedance of about 50 ohms. Okay, very good. That, that's the best explanation I've heard so far. <laughs> When I showed this to somebody else, they said, oh my gosh, you're going to short out your radio because <laughs> they, that's exactly what they thought that that was going to short it. But I said, that's what the plan's called for. And, and you know, sometimes before understanding arrives, you just follow directions and, and, and things turn out. So thanks for that, Roland. So that is basic, you said a resistor? It, it's a capacitance match. Capacitance match. Okay, capacitance match. I'm going to have to try and remember that. All right, awesome. Very cool. All so right. When you, when you get your amateur extra, you'll you'll actually calculate that. Oh, okay. Good deal. All right. I'm studying for that now. I haven't got to that part yet, but <laughs> looking forward to it. All right. And this is just a close up of how I did the the reflector and the the. Uh, director. Um, I labeled them because the, the length, the length of the mass between these is, is varies. If, if we go back to the, the full length, you'll see that there's a different length from the driven element to the director and from the driven element to the reflector. reflector. That's right. And so to make sure when I put it together, I, I get it right. I wrote reflector and ref, on the mast and reflector on the, the, uh, four-way um, connector and then the same thing on the end. I said this is the end and this is the end. That helps me not have to remember. Um, now the, I'm going to go back here. This piece of it is simply a handle. Um, you can, it actually works just fine with or without this mast piece right here. Um, I have even put in a small two or three inch one and then an elbow um, right there. To, to mount this as an antenna in places. So um, that's something to remember is that this, this last piece here is just any old piece of PVC um, or even whatever you, you have that will fit into that connector. So, um, and then another thing I, in this picture, I've got the tape measure on the front here on the end and then the tape measure on the back. Of course, when you've got it all put together, they should all be on the same side. When I put it together for this picture, I, I neglected that and my, my director is actually on the wrong side of the PVC, which would, uh, it would still work, uh, but I wouldn't get the directional um, boost that you're looking for from a Yagi antenna. Tyler? Go ahead. Uh, <laughs> that'd be great if you're not in a windstorm. <laughs> Oh, I'm glad you brought that up, Blake. That was a point I forgot I was going to make. Um, <laughs> with this design, you can actually stick some PVC um, into these, these two and use that to stiffen the tape measure. Because uh, you're absolutely correct. I've tried to use this in a windstorm, and, and you're right. It flutters and flaps all over the place. So if you want, you can uh, get some PVC pieces that are as long as the uh, antenna elements there, stick them in the hole, and, and use tape or rubber bands or whatever, or some more hose clamps even, uh, to keep them stiff. Good point. Okay. Yeah, I, I was just thinking of that. Uh, 
brain's not a hundred percent back after this stuff. Um, <laughs> no, you're good. You're good. But, I need to uh, fast forward. I just noticed I talked for 45 minutes already. So no, but another yeah, comment? I can see where you could stiffen it up, but if like you're on a mountaintop or out like that or something, and it was windy that day, unless you had something to stiffen them up, you'd be flapping like a bird. So yeah. anyway, and I, I speak wooden, from experience wooden when dowels, I see your effort. Wooden dowels work really well as well. Yep. Absolutely. They're, they're, I saw several cheaper, plans. Yeah. They're cheaper than uh, PVC. Yep. I saw several plans that called for wooden dowels um, for the cross pieces as well. So yeah, that that's good points, everybody. Thank you. Um, all right. My second tape measure antenna was inspired by a, a website I found uh, by a guy named Just Jeff. Now, Jeff is uh, actually a ham radio operator. I contacted him and asked him if I could share his call sign. He said he doesn't like to associate his call sign with his website. So there you go. But I told him I would credit his, uh, his website since that's where I got the, the idea for my next antenna. This is a, uh, he calls it a tactical um, tape measure antenna that he built. Um, he wanted, if, I don't know if you guys have seen the one advertised on Amazon that folds up and then they, they call it super tactical and it's like three feet long. Well, he wanted something like that that he could build and, and this was what he came up with. It's, he uh, finished it up with shrink wrap and uh, that spray on uh, rubber coating to, to weatherproof it and, and make it uh, more tactical, I guess. Um, and he joined the two together with, with a piece of um, the tape measure itself, which he insulated from the two elements. Um, but that's how he did it. Um, I wanted to be able to attach a mass to mine. And so I used another PVC to join the two ends of the of the dipole, and this is what I came up with. And, and really, it's it's super simple. It's um, I think it's about well, it's about 21 inches. Well, I think it's 19 because I lopped a couple inches off the beginning of it there. Uh, if I remember right, it's 19 inches. Each pole is about 19 inches long, and um, I clamped them to the T, and um, and then I drilled a hole through the T and fed my um, coax in into the, the T and then out and attached it to and soldered it to each of the poles there. Um, I apologize for the picture on the right. When I got finished with it, I wrapped it all up with duct with black tape. And then uh, I wanted to show you guys how I did the connection. So I took the black tape off, but it had, uh, <laughs> it had infected the hot glue I used to hold everything in place. So it, it looks really ugly over there. But if you look carefully, you can see how I soldered the, you know, the, the shield to one side and the, the core to the other, um, just like I did on, on the Yagi antenna. Um, and then I used hot glue to keep everything in place and wrap it all up with black tape. Uh, this is another backpacking antenna. It works just as it is, or you can, like I've done here, insert a, a piece of uh, PVC or a dowel. Um, I've used uh, fiberglass tent poles um, as, a, as a mast for this one as well. Um, and Blake, yes, the wind fluttered it all over the place. That was <laughs> one frustration I had when I used this one. Um, but it did, I made, I made a 28 mile simplex contact using this um, across a couple of mountaintops. Um, so I was pretty impressed with that. Um, it worked really well. But here is the, uh, here's the, the grand finale here. This is the antenna that inspired Roland to ask me to give this presentation. I saw this antenna on Facebook, a guy named March I'm not even gonna butcher his last name. We'll just call him Kilo 5 Yankee Alpha Charlie. He built this antenna based on an article in QST Magazine. And uh, I liked it and, and commented it on Facebook and, and Roland convinced me it would make a great Elmer Knight project. So I, I agreed and I dived in. Um, it, it looks pretty neat and it's pretty simple. Um, so I'm just, I'm just gonna walk you through um, the steps I took to build it. Real so quick, I, uh, do, do oh. haircuts come with that pole? <laughs> Looks like a barber pole. <laughs> you know, actually in the article, they call it a barber pole antenna. 
um, in there, but yeah, <laughs> that's <laughs> cool. Fun of my hair. Okay. I, I do need a haircut. <laughs> Go ahead. Anyway, or at least a hairbrush. All right. So I, I, I wanted to, I, none of my other builds, I didn't document the actual build for any of my other antennas. So I thought I'm going to, I'm going to be like those guys on, on uh, Etsy and, and uh, Pinterest. That's the one I'm thinking of that document all the things they do. So I gathered everything together, man, I was missing a ton. I had to get uh, some black tape. I had to get some uh, clear tape, scotch tape. Uh, I ended up with some scissors and a pocket knife and some screwdrivers, two or three different pairs of pliers. Boy, was I wrong when I thought this was all I would need. Um, but the first thing they, they say is, uh, in order to make sure you get the, the, the copper tape spiraled properly, the copper tape is one inch wide and, and you want a one inch gap between spirals. So they say to take a piece of two inch paper and, and use that. Well, guess what? Drywall tape is exactly two inches and I have a, a several rolls of that in my garage from uh, finishing my basement. So that's what I used. I used drywall tape. And uh, I measured out a 54 inch piece of the, the drywall tape and um, then I found the center of that because they want you to start in the center. It makes sense. You start in the center and then wrap it out. Um, and they tell you where on this PVC pipe um, to start wrapping. It's not centered on the PVC pipe. You'll see later on that the, uh, the feed point is off center. Um, you want um, the driven element or the top element to be a little bit shorter than the, the bottom element. So I used the uh, drywall tape. I taped it around there. I, I put some clear tape um, on every, every wrap. And then I started peeling it off as I drew with my Sharpie. And when I got to a piece of tape, I used my pocket knife to, to slice the tape and, and keep drawing around and around and around. So I got a nice pretty spiral around my pipe. Um, then I started putting the copper tape on. This copper tape, uh, I don't remember how long it is but it was only 10 bucks on Amazon. Um, so it's not super expensive. Um, it's pretty neat stuff. And I, I've got some other ideas for, for other projects I'll use it on. One thing I will warn you though, is if you want it to be smooth and shiny like that, you do have to stretch it. But as you can see there, you can stretch it too hard. <laughs> it's, it's not duct tape guys. Um, it will tear if you stretch it too hard. Um, However, the good news is it's very forgiving because see there where I tore it, I just took my pocket knife and cut it off straight and um, used my scissors to get a good nice straight cut on it again. And I overlapped it by about a quarter of an inch to make sure that it's still, you know, the, the it's still gonna conduct electricity properly. And, and away I went and, and carried on. So uh, the copper tape is, is pretty fragile, uh, but it is forgiving. And, and that comes into play when I start tuning it later on. Uh, being able to add and remove um, is really important. Um, so the, the, uh, the plans called for a one-to-one -one ballon, um, but they said you could also just use six turns of coax around a um, half inch pipe. So that's what I did. I, uh, I, I took the six inch pipe and I fed my coax through it and I wrapped it around there. I used black tape. Um, once I got it all wrapped good and tight, I used the black tape to, to hold it in place and make sure it stays there. And that'll actually, that ballon, that, or choke, I guess it's called a choke when you do it this way. Um, that choke is going to end up right under the base of the, the copper spirals there. Um, this, this pipe that I made the choke around actually slides inside the pole with the copper wrapping on it. Um, that serves two purposes. One, it, it positions this choke properly. And two, it keeps the coax in the very center um, of the main pole as it runs up inside the antenna. Quick question, Tyler. Sure. Go ahead. Um, excuse me on that. The six turns, what's, I guess you'd call the diameter of that? Because I noticed you got two different size PVCs, but where you're doing the ballon at, it's... Uh -huh skinnier yes correct I'm, I'm glad you pointed out i should have uh wondering that what first. that was to where i mean that'd be 
cheaper than buying a one-to-one balloon if you had to, no matter what you were making. <laughs> right. And, and you know what? That's another mystery of antennas for me is where they come up with six wraps. Um, I, did somebody calculate that or did they just trial and error? I don't know. But let me answer your question about the diameter of the pipes. And then I'll open it up to the to the to the group to see if anybody can answer that question. So the main pipe here with the copper spiral on it, that's one and a quarter inch PVC. And then um, the main part of the uh, the insert that goes inside is uh, three quarter inch. And then I narrowed it down to half inch um, to wrap the choke around. Um, that's what the plan said is to, to form the choke around half inch PVC. Um, the reason for all that is that it slides up neatly into that one and a quarter inch pipe. These, these reducers here uh, just barely clear the inside of that one and a quarter inch PVC. Um, and likewise, this choke just barely clears that one and a quarter inch PVC. So um, that's, the, that's the diameters of the pipe I've got there. Does anybody out there want to want to address how do they come up with six wraps forms a one to one balance? Is that a calculation or is that a rule of thumb? Does anybody know about that? Well, no? yeah, Go ahead. it is a, it is a calculation. The uh, essentially what you're making is an inductor. You know, it's a it's essentially a coil, an inductor. And, okay. uh, and then because it's, you know, essentially what it's intending to do is uh, uh, to keep the electrical or the RF energy from coming back down the coax. And, and uh, by, by wrapping that, you know, wrapping that around, you can actually measure how many millihenries of inductance that you're, that you're getting and, and, uh, and, and how much you need depends upon the frequency that you're operating at. And so that's how it's calculated. Okay, so if, if I was building this antenna for HF, uh, would it would it? You would need more coil. I mean, you would need more, more coils. You would need more more uh, turns. Okay, all right, very cool. I, I I read that in plans all the time, and nobody ever offers explanation. They just say, put three or four wraps around it, and 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 that'll be good. And and I always wondered, <laughs> did somebody calculate that, or is it? trial and error and, I, and I, I would think a lot of them are probably trial and error they, they they do that and see if it works but it's good to know that there is a calculation out there all right and really quick go ahead um what are the odds of maybe putting these this antenna together in like um pre-made kits that we can build out in elmer's night if we were to pay for the supplies you know, I'm, I wouldn't be opposed to that. It's, it's really not that complicated. I built it. I started building it. Well, I've been collecting pieces for a week or two, but I didn't actually um, start building until last night about 7 p.m. And I, I worked until about 9. And then I finished it up today on my lunch break. So I would say two or three hours max. Um, but you're right, Casey, if, if we... Uh, you know, pre-cut and pre-drilled these things, we could cut down a lot of that. And then a lot of the time I spent was messing around with doing stupid stuff um, and having to redo it. So yeah, you're right. This would be a great hands-on for a build night. Um, Roland, we, should we put that on our list of things to do when we can get together in person again? Yeah, we need to have an antenna building night. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, might, yeah some absolutely. People Casey. want to build that uh, tape measure dipole, and others people might want to also build the tape measure Yagi. Yeah, absolutely. That that's a great idea, Casey. Um, I also go ahead. Want to ask about doing a class of using that um, little analyzer to measure the antennas and things like that. I've been seeing that that device on Amazon for a while now, and I. Wanted to get it, but I wasn't really quite sure how it would apply to ham radio you until now. I can, I can, I'll, I'll be the salesman, Casey, and tell you that sucker is so useful. And, and like I said, I'm an amateur at this, and I, I don't even understand half of what it does. 
<laughs> but it definitely applies to ham radio. And, and here's the thing is it, it, I can use it from 160 meters all the way up to 70 centimeters and probably higher. I think it'll actually go up into gigahertz. Uh, I'm not positive on that. Um, but uh, for what it is, I think it's awesome. So I, I would definitely recommend you get it. And yes, uh, a class on the VNA is definitely in the future. Scott, uh, uh, KJ7LAX taught one a while back. Um, I missed that class, but um, we could definitely have that again. And I, I could share what I've learned about it anyway um, and using it in building antennas. So, yep, we'll definitely uh, put that on the calendar as well. Is there uh, any other comments or questions? All right, so, so with my choke formed and, and taped in place, I was ready to join the two pieces together. Here's, here's the two pieces laying side by side in roughly uh, how they're going to be once the smaller one is inside the larger one. As, as you'll see, the choke uh, is positioned roughly uh, at the bottom of the coils, all right? And then um, the, uh, the end comes out through this end cap um, and, and I'm gonna drill a hole through the, the, the main one there and separate the copper tape. Notice that the, the left side or the lower side is longer than the right side. Um, and that's how the directions have you set it up. Um, and that comes, that's important when we get to the tuning later. Um, I'll cover why, why there's a diff, well, I, once again, I, I don't understand all the theory of why there's a difference there, <laughs> but I will tell you uh, what difference that makes. All right. Um, so now I got them inserted and I, I fished the coax out through uh, through the hole there. Notice uh, I, I drilled the hole there where they told me to uh, in the copper tape and um, separated one inch um, of the copper tape um, for this hole to go in. Um, and then down here on the end. Now you'll notice there's a big ginormous hole there. Why didn't I use a much smaller drill bit to keep that cable centered. Well, I had a bright idea. <laughs> the, the, the plans I saw on Facebook, the guy actually mounted um, an SO239 adapter into that end cap. And I thought, that's great. Then you don't have an antenna hanging out. You can just use any old jumper cable you got laying around to connect this antenna up. But then I got to the point where you got to mount that sucker in there and you've got to solder one wire to the center, and then you got to screw the other one to the to the frame, and then you got to stick the end cap on. Guys, that was just too much for me. I mean, some of you might be able to, to do that, but it was just too much for me. So I just went with a pigtail. Um, I just ran the cable out. So I ended up with a hole big enough to put an SO239 connector in there um, instead of a neat little hole that the coax will just fit out of. But I'm gonna fix that with hot glue. Um, I haven't done it yet, but uh, I'll gum that sucker up with hot glue until it's, uh, it's as good as if I had drilled a tight hole. All right. Um, this illustrates another rule, I guess. Uh, I'm using air quotes, a rule for um, following other people's plans. Sometimes they have skills that you don't. Uh, the guy that built this, I, I, I really love the build that he made on Facebook. Um, and it looks like he did a really super professional job, but I just don't have the soldering skills and my big fat ham fisted fingers don't, don't fit putting screws into tight pace spaces like that. So uh, maybe in the future, I'll, I'll develop the skills and the tools to do that kind of thing. But don't be afraid to deviate from the plans you're following. Um, as long as you stick with the general principles of antenna building, um, <clears throat> don't be afraid to improvise, all right? Um, okay, so um, I went back up to the top there and I, <coughs> I stripped back my coax and I, I peeled back the shield. Um, the shield is, uh, I, I covered it with black tape to keep it from unraveling. I tried a couple of times, I tinned the ends of the wire. 
but that made it un inflexible. Notice that it has to make a pretty uh, pretty sharp curve to get back there to uh, to the copper wrap. Um, and so I ended up just wrapping black tape tightly around it. If you have shrink wrap, that's probably a better idea. I put the ring connectors on there and I did solder the ring connectors on there after crimping them on, uh, just because I've seen too many of those crimps uh, come apart. So I, I, I stripped the wire so it was long enough to stick through all the way through the ring connector. I crimped it and then I put solder right there at the neck of the, the ring there to make sure that stayed in place. And um, again, this hole is gonna get filled up with hot glue uh, to make sure these, these cables don't get yanked out or snagged on anything. Um, I, I will have to experiment with, and I'm not sure about covering this up. I thought that maybe um, if I covered it with black tape or, or maybe even just clear packing tape, um, I don't know how that will affect the signal, if at all. Um, but once again, that's something we can experiment with and, and see what happens. Um, now be sure when you hook this up, the core of the wire, you can see that that's the white. I left the, the white. Is that called dielectric, Roland, material? <laughs> I think that's the term I'm looking for. Um, that surrounds the core. I left that in place to protect the wire as it's, as it's going around that sharp curve. Um, that goes to the top element and the shield goes to the bottom element. All right. Um, then I was ready to tune. I hooked it up to my uh, battle VNA and I, uh, and I measured it. This was the initial SWR, not too good. Um, now, if, if you're not familiar with, with the, what the van, Nano VNA shows, let me just orient you to this graph real quick. Up this side, the, the vertical axis is the uh, SWR. Um, across the bottom is the frequency. I set it to, to sweep, um, continuously sweep from 144 to 148 megahertz. All right, um, these red lines I use um, when I'm building HF antennas, my HF radio can, can tune anything below 3.0 and down. So that's, that's kind of my goal is 2.9 when I'm building HF antennas. And then 1.5 down there, that's the ideal. Of course, any antenna, you can get it below 1.5, that's awesome. Um, so initially we had uh, from uh, just below three all the way up to almost three and a half um, SWR, which, which of course is not good. Um, the, uh, the instructions say that you adjust SWR adjustments by varying the ratio of top wraps to bottom wraps. It starts out at about three and a half to four and a half, um, if you follow the plans as I did. Um, in order to adjust the SWR, you vary that ratio. You take some off of the top or you take some off of the bottom to, to get them closer or farther apart um, in the, the top to bottom ratio. Uh, frequency adjustments come by varying the overall length. So if you want to change the frequency, you have to either add or subtract the same amount to both top and bottom. And that'll move your, your frequency um, up and down. Um, of course, I played with it. I, I, I initially, so this one over here is um, three wraps up and four wraps down. Uh, moved it down a little bit. Three up and three and a quarter down. Finally got me this nice dip here. If you'll notice this little red dot right here, that is 147.300, the South Mountain repeater. I kind of used that as my... Uh, my goalpost. I said I want to make sure that that frequency at least is below the 1.5 line, and uh, I, I eventually got it there. But then I went too far. <laughs> I wanted to get it even better. I was trying to uh, trying to smooth out that dip. That's a pretty that's a pretty uh, sharp dip there. I wanted to 
um, smooth that out and I went too far. And all of a sudden it jumped back up to nearly three and a half. So that's, that's the second time I was grateful for the copper tape because the copper tape allowed me to just cut another piece and stick it back on. When you're uh, trimming copper wire, <laughs> it's not that easy. You cut it too short. Sometimes you got to start over. Um, make sure once again that you overlap a quarter inch so that the, the connectivity works. So this is this is where I ended up. Um, this These are three different measurements I took for specific frequencies. So the South Mountain, of course, and for some reason, I, I told it 147.300, but but the, the readout came 147.320. Uh, I'm not sure what that's all about, but um, you can see my my SWR was one point ended up at 1.4 for the South Mountain. Uh, the uh, Crook Peak, the the Vernon Repeater was 1.9, and the Farnsworth Peak was 1.3. Guys. 1.3. Um, and I did make a radio check with Blake here in my basement with my uh, bow fang. Uh, I talked to Blake in Wendover and he said I sounded just fine. So uh, it passed the push to talk test. All right. So um, I appreciate you guys listening to me ramble on. I, I hope you've, you've heard something that uh, if not learned something, at least I piqued your interest in, in building your own antenna. Um, I know I got discouraged when I first started because you go to for Facebook or you go to a, one of the, the ham forums out there and you ask a question <laughs> and a lot of your answers, not all of them, but a lot of your answers fall into one of two categories, either the I've been doing it that way since Marconi and I mounted the uh, telegraph on the Titanic and so that's the way it is and don't question me or the doctorate level uh, lecture on Fourier analysis and uh, quantum physics, uh, neither of which is very helpful when you're trying to understand how to do it. Um, you don't need either one of those levels of experience to be able to experiment and understand. Learn the basics, you know, learn, learn what a ground plane is, learn why a radial is, <laughs> learn why a choke is what a choke is, uh, watch lots of videos, read lots of articles, uh, but get your hands on something, uh, put something together. Uh, that's the best way to learn. Um, and and if, you, if you didn't remember anything else from my, my rambling uh, presentation tonight, uh, I just want you to know that the best way to learn is to dive in, figure it out. Um, I'm gonna close with this, this slide from uh, my presentation last month at the, at the meeting. Uh, we, we are always welcome for ideas and volunteers. If you have a class that you want us to teach, like Casey talk, spoke up tonight, you're, I promise you, Casey, that's going on my list. Um, it, or if you have something you'd like to share with us, uh, you can put it in the chat um, right now, or you can send an email to me, my call sign, kj7tcw at gmail.com, and uh, we would love to, to put it in there. Um, I'm going to make this, uh, Roland is going to make this presentation available to you guys, either on Facebook or the webpage or both. And uh, here's all the URLs uh, that I referred to in there. I, I might be missing a couple, but I'll update it, make sure they're all there. So you can go see all the good stuff yourself. All right, Roland, that's all I've got for tonight. Um, Real quick to you. All right, we're open for questions, so go ahead, Blake. Oh, well, not so much question, but uh, just uh, thinking of antennas I built back in the old days, well, for me, old days, late 90s. Uh, I know a lot of us guys that have been in it for a long time will recognize the name, but it was called a cubicle quad beam antenna. Anyway, over the next few weeks I am planning on building one of those again five element one for uh, of course I'm going to use it horizontal but they'd be simple to make and tune and anyway I'm planning on building one so I'll take pictures and stuff as I go along making it and uh, pass them on if y'all want to check it out or pass it on or however you do this 
uh, Zoom gives more stuff. So anyway, just wanted to let you know. That'd be great. Cubicle quad antennas are really, really good antennas. Oh, wow. Wow, yeah. they are big time. So yeah. a lot quieter than beam antenna too. But anyway, all right, back to you, Roland and Tyler. Thanks. Okay. Well, we'll let, uh, we'll let uh, Tyler stop sharing his screen. Okay. And we will, and we will, um, <clears throat> we will put the uh, um, slide presentation up on the uh, website and a link to it on the uh, on the Facebook page. The uh, I think it's, uh, it's 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 of interest. We had a couple of interesting things that came through in the chat, and the chat will be included with it, with the uh, presentation as well. The um, anybody else have anything they want to say or uh, bring up or comment on before we uh, uh, close our tonight's Elmer night? Okay, silence is golden. Thank you all. Have a great evening <clears throat> and a great remainder of your week. Uh, remember, our next uh, meeting will be on the uh, first Wednesday in March. The, um, if I remember that date, is uh, March the 3rd uh, at, uh, at 7 p.m. Um, we're, we've got a couple of options of what we're going to do that evening, uh, but it's not uh, set yet, but it will be fairly soon. And then uh, on the third Wednesday, which is March the 17th, St. Patrick's Day, uh, we will have an Elmer's Elmer night and we'll be watching a video presentation on uh, the uh, HIPAA Act's in effect on amateur radio. The uh, HIPAA Act has to do with the uh, confidentiality, uh, confidentiality of uh, medical information, <clears throat> the health insurance, portability, something or another act. And, uh, and, and, and it comes into play whenever we're involved in a, any type of an emergency incident. Okay, thank you all very much. Have a great weekend, uh, a great remainder of your week and a good and a nice weekend. And uh, we'll hopefully hear you on the radio on our nets at one o'clock in the afternoon uh, every day and on, one, on Thursday evenings at 8 p.m. Uh, Roger does a great job. Thank you all, good night.